It's that time when people head to the desert, where several factions will vie for attention and information. You'll find arguments about the future of technology and culture. You'll find discussions about the consequences of computers from 10,000 years ago. You have to be careful in large groups. You'll need to wear a mask and... No, hold on. Those are plot points from the book Dune. DEF CON started barely 30 years ago. Black Hat and B-Sides Las Vegas, even less than that. They do have the same point about computers, though. Which means, this week we talk with Tom Hudson from Detectify about the challenges that modern web apps bring to manual and automated security testing. In the news segment, hardware hacking goes dot dot slash, hardware RNGs go to zero, HTTP request smuggling goes from two to one, Kubernetes hardware hardening goes big, dependency confusion goes away, and more. Check your still suit and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news. It's time for Application Security Weekly. DisruptOps helps you find and fix cloud security issues fast. Getting bombarded with irrelevant alerts is frustrating. DisruptOps gives security and DevOps teams prioritized findings and routes relevant alerts to Slack or Microsoft Teams with automated response options that save you time. Finally, security is inside your workflow instead of in your way. Listeners can access the full platform free for 30 days by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash DisruptOps. Looking to improve your web application security? Probly is reinventing web application security. Probly focuses on the vulnerabilities that matter, eliminates false positives with evidence-based scanning, and provides a simple point-and-shoot solution that is easy to use. Probly's thorough coverage ensures accurate identification of vulnerabilities in any modern web application or API. Improve your web application security processes by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash Probly and start your free trial today. In any business today, there comes a moment, the moment you realize you can secure the code as fast as you write it. Instead of testing everything, you can just test the right things. It's not about tools, but intelligent risk management. That's the moment you choose Synopsys. Build secure, high quality software faster. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Synopsys. This is episode 161, recorded August 9th, 2021. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with John Kinsella. Hello, John. Hello, Mike Shima. Happy Monday. How are you? Don't mind me just sort of bobbing my head back and forth to that theme song. Excellent. Keep on bopping because it's a great theme song. And uh, it's good to have you here, John. Uh, the other thing that you can start bopping along to is that SC Media debuts its all new SC Digital Experience. It's fully integrated with Security Weekly Podcast content, just like us, and more. I love seeing that phrase. The new site increases the scope and scale of original content resources from editorial staff, contributors, and the far reaching Cyber Risk Alliance Network. Visit SC Magazine to check out, oh, visit scmagazine.com to check out the new look. I'll read through this eventually. Join us August 26th at 11 a.m. Eastern to learn how to implement cloud security that actually works. And if you missed any of our previously recorded webcasts or technical trainings, they are available for your viewing pleasure at securityweekly.com slash on demand. Tom Hudson started his career as a software engineer and got into security when a former employer invited him to the company bug bounty program. The experience landed him on the HackerOne scoreboard, which is a good thing. Since then, Tom has become a prominent figure in the hacker community, known for his many hacking tools that he hosts on GitHub. Hello, Tom. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank you for having me. And uh, happy Monday to you both as well. It's quite a happy Monday. And uh, one of the things that makes me particularly happy is that we're talking about a topic that's pretty near and dear to my heart about web scanning, whether we're doing it with our fingers on keyboards or uh, through automation. And uh, just it, it, for set, and setting some context too, my background was at Qualys working on a web application scanner. So I've seen what the challenges were 10, 12 years ago, what, what modern apps were at the time. But Tom, you're working on this in now, currently. And uh, you see a lot of what modern web apps look like, single page web apps, APIs. And um, how does web app scanning look for those? Have things gotten easier for the scanning side of things? 
uh, I think they've actually got quite a lot harder in a lot of ways. Um, you know, back 10, 15 years or so ago, web pages were pretty simple, HTML, maybe a bit of JavaScript to sort of augment their functionality. But for the most part, they were, you know, stateless applications, send requests, get HTML back. And that meant that scanners were pretty simple as well, right? They send requests, they get HTML back, they analyze the HTML, they see if anything untoward has happened. Uh, but the modern web applications, uh, not so much. Uh, single page applications, especially if you run them through these sort of traditional uh, if there is such thing as a traditional web scanner, these traditional <laughs> web scanners, you know, you get enough HTML and JavaScript back to bootstrap a single page application. And then every single request that you send ends up in that same thing. So uh, those kinds of scanners kind of start to fail uh, with those kinds of applications. Uh, and APIs equally as problematic as well, because, you know, we spent a lot of years figuring out how to crawl web pages. Uh, and then the web pages went and changed, <laughs> uh, and APIs also become difficult to crawl as well. Yeah, I think in, in my day it was crawl the site, parse some HTML, look for the links, find some forms, submit, observe, and move on from there. Uh, and you're describing what what I think is from a development perspective, design perspective, is a good switch moving to more API heavy, API driven applications, especially applications that those APIs might drive the mobile app as well as a web app, perhaps. But one of my questions here, too, is that from a high level, from sort of, from one perspective, I, th I would hope that APIs are a bit more self-documenting. They at least tell you or ostensibly tell you, this is how you're supposed to interact with me. Does that help these scanners or help just from security testing in general, too? Or how does it make that different the, the, when we're looking at APIs specifically? Yeah, it helps to an extent. And um you know, a great deal of APIs are fairly well documented, including self-documenting APIs, um, or at least the ones that are sort of intended for public consumption are the kinds of APIs that companies write to power their own websites and mobile apps and things like that, often documented internally, uh, but, you know, sort of pen testers, but bounty hunters and scanners uh, kind of have to resort to trying to reverse engineer things, um, which can be pretty tricky. So... Uh, and, you know, although they're self-documenting, they're pretty good at telling you about a particular API endpoint or a particular API method, uh, but not really so much at telling you how those methods work together. So, like, what the authentic authentication flow looks like. There'll be, a you know, a, a plain English description of how that works, but not really often so much for a machine to be able to consume and automatically do all of that stuff for you. You have to really hold their hands with it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's this, that aspect of building a con... Oh, go ahead, John. So, sorry, this this documentation thing of which you speak, uh -oh. could you tell me more about that? <laughs> I've never heard about that before. No, um, but on a serious note there, I, and I'm not sure where Mike was going to go with this, so hopefully it's the same direction or, or sort of close. Um, I'd be curious what you think about, how about the exact opposite? How about if someone has... A API which is machine readable. So if someone's doing something, either they've developed their APIs with Postman or Swagger, Open API 2.0, um, I imagine that makes your life a little bit easier as a tester. How about uh, for Malcreants? Is it, would you consider that or a good or bad thing? Yeah, I'd say that again. Sorry. So are you familiar with like uh, Open API or yes, Swagger yeah, or things like that? Okay. Yeah, so what I'm, I'm sure you're curious. Part, sorry. Yeah, I just, I, I'm curious, you know, I, I'm sure those can make your life easier as a tester. Um, what about for the other side of the fence, for um, someone with malicious intent? Is that oh, yeah. helping or hindering, or, or or am I just sort of barking up a, a square tree or something weird? I think I think it definitely helps on the sort of the malicious side of things, so to speak. Although, you know, I, I don't have any experience with being actually malicious, of course. Uh, but from mm -hmm. sort of a pen tester, red teamer, bounty hunter sort of perspective, it definitely helps. You know, having absolutely zero documentation for an API uh, can leave you in a position where you can't make it do anything at all. You know, you don't necessarily know what authentication mechanisms it supports or even how just to call a method in the first place. So you can spend hours, days, reverse engineering that stuff. And you can just skip all that if it's documented. Mm. So I, I I know there's all sorts of managers out there 
about to start screaming at their people to stop using open open API. So I didn't want to go quite that far. Is is where's the what's the balance around that? Um, in other words, from a point of view of, okay, we want to make something documented and, and usable by our developers. Um, and, you know, if it makes testing easier and, and gives us a better overall picture, um, but sort of closing the circle on that, hopefully people, would it be safe to say, hopefully people are documenting and they are testing that by the time that documentation gets into someone else's hands, um, that's a secure product? Uh, I'm not sure there's such thing, really, as a secure product, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I think from my perspective, that kind of documentation being available to attackers can, you know, it speeds things up for them for sure. Um, but it speeds up all of the ethical hackers as well so much. Mm. But I think in general, it's probably a net positive. I think, you know, one thing that we've probably all learned is attackers can be incredibly determined uh, and yeah. often work on, you know, not infinite budget, but often you know a lot more time than say a pen tester would have in a week-long engagement uh, and they can spend years keeping an eye on your stuff and reverse engineering it so uh, i think you know if there is a vulnerability there all you're really doing is delaying the inevitable rather than actually increasing security by withholding the documentation if that makes sense yeah, that's a great point. And I know, to be clear, too, I know, John, you weren't going down the route of, you know, security and obscurity. It's more that yeah. discussion of there is a documentation. Can't, how, can we, how can we leverage it to be most helpful? And I think where I was kind of tying that in, too, is that a lot of the documentation, especially if the API could be self-documenting, is, is really helpful for both the tester as well as the developer and security testers in that group as well. But I think those tend to be just discrete about this is this one particular API, how to interact with it. But there is a wealth of interesting things that can go on when you start to build up the context within an application. And this is where I get into that very broad, but unfortunately too shallowly described category of business logic vulnerabilities. Uh, because you need to say, ah, here's the context where we set up the authentication state. We need to put the, the, the this session into this particular state so that we can do this other type of attack in this other state. And figuring that out between which API to use in sequence can be kind of tough. So I, I want to throw it back over to you, Tom, to maybe tell us a little bit about, do you see anything that's different types of vulnerabilities within APIs? Or are there different types of vulns that these API developers should really be worried about? And um, I, I'm going to say up front, I, I'm, my fingers crossed, and I hope it's not going to just be the familiar SQL injection and cross-site scripting, because oof, if that's still what the top problems are, we're not in good spot. Yeah. I mean, those things definitely do still exist. Uh, Cross-site scripting, less of a problem on APIs generally, because they tend to return Applicant, application mm -hmm. JSON content types that aren't rendered as HTML in browsers and so on. Mistakes still do happen, but it's certainly less common. Um, as you said, those kind of business logic errors are incredibly common uh, in APIs because really, you know, what is an API if not an abstraction around business logic? You know, there's no presentation or anything there. So really it's about as close to business logic as you get as sort of the consumer of an application, so to speak. Um, I think still, uh, to this day, the most common things tend to be mix up between authentication and authorization. So you get uh, insecure direct object reference type vulnerabilities where you know the code's checking someone's logged in, but not necessarily that they should actually have access to that particular piece of information. So um, you can see other users' data and so on and so forth. That kind of thing crops up a lot. Um, I think increasingly. Uh, with APIs being powered by other APIs and this sort of microservices architecture that's increasingly popular these days, uh, we're seeing problems with the uh, the middleware effectively, the transport between those APIs where you know headers can be injected and you get path traversals between things because it's pretty common to pass user yes. data into the path of a downstream API call. Um, and we're increasingly seeing things like that. Yeah, I guess similar to to that is um you see I, I'm going to guess SSRF and uh, cores because cores I think is uh, much more relevant to to API design. So you know, have you seen these vulnerabilities? We're replacing the cross site scripting 
and putting the 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 what am I trying to say the the burden onto the front end presentation layer to use React or other things that are XSS resistant. We have those old prepared statements for SQL injection, but now API are introducing cores misconfigurations or SSRF. Do we have a two-part question for you? For on the developer side, do we have good frameworks or at least good design patterns that the security community is sharing with developers? And um, do we have good ways of finding those? If when we start talking about scanners, or do those types of vulns lend themselves to scanning more easily? Uh, I, I think we're getting a little bit better about it. Uh, I think cause is especially is still pretty misunderstood uh, in a lot of cases. There's quite a few edge cases to consider with cause. So, uh, for example, um, uh, trusting a null origin is a really common one. So, it allow unlike the wildcard, allows credentials to be sent, uh, and a null origin is the default if you are sort of loading HTML files in your browser just off disk. So, if your developers are doing development in that way. They might be tempted to, you know, allow the null origin so that the developers can do their work. But then, once that gets out into the wild, you can force a null origin with a sandbox iframe, and then suddenly it becomes a vulnerability. Um, and also, just you know, the lack of uh, sort of built-in partial wildcarding into the cause specification. So you can either say, you know, any site, and that means that implies that credentials won't be sent with requests, uh, or you can accept the origin header and do some allow listing or processing on it or something and then reflect that back in, into the response uh, but it's really easy to get that wrong right like <laughs> domains have dots in them so if you're using regular expressions the dots end up as wildcards if you don't escape them i've seen that time and time again um on the uh, the ssrf side of things i think again more servers are talking to other servers than they used to be so uh, it's inevitably going to create more of those kinds of issues, especially where uh, you can get things like uh, uh, header injection in downstream responses that can cause redirects that bounce things around to different pages and so on and so forth. Now, so what about is kind of just trying to extend that onto the developer friendly side of side of the conversation? Are there Better ways that we can be have you know better defensive programming techniques for APIs, um, whether it's you mentioned something very specific about re using regular expressions for matching, making sure you match the dots, the dots aren't wildcards, yeah. making sure you're matching the entire string so that you're not accidentally matching just a substring of a domain against a longer domain that you didn't intend it for cores. So that's very tactical, but um, you mentioned too about authorization authentication problems that you've seen crop up quite a bit how can how can we help uh, developers be better protected against those types of flaws uh, i think from my perspective one of the best things we can do is try and make it hard to do the wrong thing as much as we can mm -hmm. so uh, in the case of like the authentication versus authorization thing uh, you know if the uh, authorization part is baked into your data access layer at a code level. So, for example, you have to provide a user object to a, a class constructor for your model or a method signature or whatever it is. If that's enforced at a code level, it makes it a lot harder to make those mistakes than if you're sort of ad hoc doing those checks at more like the, the controller layer in the, in the MVC model, which is, uh, I assume people still use MVC, right? It's, uh, that's not gone away just yet. <laughs> um, so, you know, having that enforced so that your developers can't avoid it or they have to jump through a lot of hoops to do something that's potentially risky, I think is probably one of the best things we can do. And then do you see, uh, I'm kind of switching between, uh, we're wearing two hats, if you will, on the developer side, creating these APIs, and we start off talking on the testing side. What about tools? So, you know, we did have start with the premise that it's hard for scanners to, to deal with a lot of these applications. Are scanners getting better, or what can either the, the AppSec team looking at security, analyzing security, or maybe the DevOps team building secure APIs and trying to test them through their CI/CD process. What, what are the smart ways to, to look at tools or to leverage tools and expectations for them for, as they're just trying to understand security of what they're building? Yeah. So I mean, there's increasingly many uh, static analysis tools that do a pretty good job of identifying like potentially problematic uh, patterns in code. 
uh, but they tend to only really be uh, as powerful as the patterns that you give them, so to speak. So, you know, they can turn a bunch of code into an abstract syntax tree and uh, look for particular patterns where you've done uh, like a non-constant time comparison for passwords or something like that. All right, Th those exist and, and they're getting better, um, but they're not magic. Uh, they're not going to find anything. So I, I think personally, dynamic analysis tools um, are, are a place to look. So um, one of the things that uh, I worked with in the past was a... Uh, dynamic analysis tool that tracked uh, variables that had been tainted was the terminology that it used. So, you know, as you're running your application, uh, this particular variable was created using some user input. So it's going to be flagged and then it's going to fire off um, stack traces every time it's used so that you can see uh, every place. Uh, and that gives the scanners the context to understand what's really going on. Uh, because you know, there's only so much you can do with static analysis, and how much you can do depends on the language you're using as well. So, um, perhaps a silly example, but I think some time ago someone proved you can't statically analyze Perl, uh, which was you know a surprise to nobody. Uh, but if you're writing in say Java, for example, then the wealth of tools that are available to you are going to be much better uh, at doing their job. Um, I think, you know, one of the main things for me is there's no silver bullets. There's only bullets and you probably need a machine gun, right? So, you know, the CI, CD type tools that you mentioned before things have gone live, but also, you know, once things have gone live, uh, there's problems that can only rear their head there, whether they're environmental or they're related to data or uh, any of those other things. Um Kind of curious is you mentioned that that last point too about the, when it goes live things are different. You, your your data that you're testing on the scale of what your how your application is, is interacting with, uh, and it, it all change. So I, I definitely agree that that things are can be surprising. I'm kind of curious if you do you have some maybe examples or could tell us a bit more about you know APIs that are, are surprising to people or API surprises that uh, would be good to keep an eye out for or you know patterns to to avoid for that matter perhaps oh yeah that's a good question um so one of the things that i think it's mostly it doesn't crop up very often but i i found it quite interesting is where the data itself can have an impact on uh the api and how it behaves so um hmm. if you're familiar with uh, the idea of a second order sql injection for example um which is where the re results of some SQL statement, which were user controlled somehow, are then used in a second SQL statement, and then the injection happens there. So there's this sort of second order uh, effect. I've seen that happen with uh, APIs a couple of times as well, where you know in the test environment with just simple test data, there was no problem uh, because you know, all the data was input by engineers who knew how things would work. Uh, and then later, some other API consumes that. Um, and then when it hits production, it turns out there's loads of junk data in there. Uh, and suddenly it's causing problems and making things crash and, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think that's a, a pretty good example of the kinds of things that can go wrong, along with you know simple things of the config just the configuration is different in production from test because in test you know debugging was enabled or it was running in a single thread mode uh, and then in production it's multi-threaded and suddenly there's race conditions for example it, that brings up an interesting point too because uh one of course the the danger of assumptions you know uh, the developers were testing in the ways that they think the context of how the API, how the microservice, if you will, should be tested. And there's a big difference too in, in terms of, well, maybe not a difference, but just the the prevalence or where, where APIs are present. They, I was coming into this thinking with a mind of APIs externally facing to the internet, driving the web browser, driving the uh, mobile app, for example. But I guess as you're pointing out, there's a lot of internal APIs being built as well to drive these applications. And maybe they aren't as 
as well documented? They aren't as protected or are the assumptions different? Maybe, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think, think of a new and different question here, but maybe I just want to come back around to internal APIs. I kind of forgot about that. Is it, uh, how, how much concern should we have or what's our way of approaching the security for these internal APIs? Uh, I think that's a really good question, actually. Uh, they are overlooked greatly. Um, and, you know, it, it's quite the sort of traditional model of network security, right, is you have this ring of trust. Um, and if you're on the inside of it, then you're trusted and everything's fine. Um, and I think that's really common with internal APIs to sometimes not have any kind of authentication at all. Uh, or if they do have authentication, it's single user and there's no access control. So that context of uh, who the originator of the request is, is lost once you cross that internal API boundary. Uh, uh, and that's, I guess, kind of the root cause of a lot of issues to do with things like path traversal on APIs, for example, or occasionally idols as well. Um, uh, but also, you know, it kind of increases the risk from things like SSRFs. So um, I've looked at systems before where uh, I've discovered uh, an SSRF vulnerability and I've been able to hit internal APIs, which had no authentication uh, and, you know, <laughs> served up all of the user data. I think that's definitely an issue. Um, I think companies are becoming more aware of that and moving more towards the sort of, it's a bit buzzwordy, but the zero trust uh, model effectively, where being on the network doesn't actually gain you anything uh, as an attacker. You know, you don't actually really have access to all that much more than you would if you were just on the public internet. Yeah, and I agree. I, I know some people have a bit of resistance against the term zero trust, but I think it does still convey a really good um, meaning in the sense, just like you pointed out, why should we trust you just because of your place on the network? Give me some attestation about your identity, and I'll tell you what you're authorized to to access. Uh, so definitely, definitely zero trust. We need it, for, as you're saying, need it for APIs and you know mutual authentication more so than just the developers writing the code. Um, one of the things also, uh, looking forward we've, to the future, we've been talking a lot about there are problems with scanning. You gave us a little bit of insight into how to position scanning and, and the idea of what the, the context matters about what you're looking at or knowing the limitations of a tool. Um, but from a tooling perspective, what do you see as a future for API scanning or web application scanning in, in general, perhaps? Is there hope? Uh, I think there is definitely some hope. Um, you know, increasingly, people who are building the APIs are going to want to know that they're secure, uh, and we'll probably start to try and build them in a way that makes them more amenable to automated scanning. Because why wouldn't you? Uh, but from sort of the black box scanner side of things, I think we're increasingly moving away from the old style: fetch the HTML, do some assertions on it, uh, into driving real web browsers. Because you know, if you said before, if you fetch the HTML for a single page web application, it doesn't tell you anything. Um, you know, you, you get one request for the HTML and you find the JavaScript source in there and then there's no amount of static analysis, or at least <laughs> no easy amount of static analysis that's going to really tell you anything about that application. So by driving a real web browser, we can load the real page, we can monitor the interactions that it has uh, with the back end. So things, uh, calls that happen over XHR or fetch calls that the JavaScript makes, basically, um, including two APIs, right? So if these applications are uh, getting all of their data from an API and it's not documented, one of the things we can do is uh, instrument a real web browser uh, and have it you know, navigate around the page and make actions and observe those API requests so that we can... Um, resend them with modified parameters and things like that and do uh, fuzzing against those different parameters, including trying to you know, add new ones and things that we might have garnered from, say, an open API specification. So mm -hmm. you know, we might ingest that and say, one method has this debug parameter. Let's transpose that uh, and try it on all of the different methods and do uh, a diff between the responses and see if anything happens and go from there. 
Yeah, that would be lovely to see. Just as, as you're describing, uh, collecting those parameters and having some good, some basic semantic understanding. Of just what is this? Is this parameter a, a number? Is it an identifier? Is it a debug ID? Th- something like that. That that would be wonderful to see. Uh, anything else you'd like to to highlight either on some work you're doing? I know you have a a, a pretty big uh, GitHub repo yourself, um, or the the work that you've been doing at Detectify. Uh, I've not been doing a great deal of stuff on my own uh, projects recently, but uh, something we did, uh, I did at Detectify recently was actually quite related, certainly to the single page application side of things. So we released a tool called PageFetch, um, which, amongst other things, loads web pages and all of their resources and saves them all to disk, uh, but also allows you to run arbitrary JavaScript on every web page. Um, and then that means you can use it to detect client side vulnerabilities uh, and to do research mm-hmm. as well, which is you know why we built it because we can now pretty easily feed it a list of URLs and interrogate the DOM to find out what JavaScript libraries are loaded. Um, we can uh, hook XHR calls and, and um, save the responses from those to give us information about the kinds of APIs that are being accessed and where and so on. Um, and also to just to directly look for client-side vulnerabilities like uh, prototype pollution or DOM XSS. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I built that as part of uh, some early research into, you know, how, how do we crawl a single page application to just get these endpoints uh, in the first place. So it was really nice to be able to, you know, get that open source and let other people have a play with it too. That, that sounds really fun. I love the idea of turn, turning the browser against itself because you know, what better place to inspect the DOM than in the browser with JavaScript? I love it. Um, Tom, I want to say uh, thank you for uh, joining us and filling us in on the, some of the challenges and uh, fortunately some of the future that looks positive for uh, API and web application scanning. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Also, I want to thank John and want to thank all of our listeners out there. If you'd like to learn more about Detectify, visit securityweekly.com slash detectify. We're going to take a quick break now and return with news of the week. 